your career now really does transcend any kind of professional definition. You've gone beyond doctor. You've gone beyond psychiatrist. How do you view yourself, your becoming, and the social role that you play now? I always have not fit into the model of a doctor, or certainly not a psychiatrist. Um, my first country practice was a real old-fashioned Swiss country practice where a doctor who was, you know what best, who best a lot she was in Switzerland? And you he, he's, our, he's our <laughs> Swiss hero who started the first orphanages. And if somebody gives their shirt away, you call him a pestalozzi. That's like a nickname. It has certain connotation to it. And uh, uh, this country doctor died, and he was known never to make a bill to a family more than once. If they didn't pay the bill, he never sent them a second bill, because he understood that if they could pay, they would pay. But then came Christmas or harvest season, he would get apples or whatever. And so when this man suddenly, unexpectedly died, they called the medical school and were looking for a pestalozzi, and I got the job. And I worked in those days for $10, the equivalent of about $10 a day, and I was happy as a lark, and I really loved this practice, because I never had to worry about bookkeeping or making bills. I would send them a bill, and I knew if they couldn't pay they wouldn't have to feel guilty or embarrassed. And the Mother's Day, they would need a sweater or they would bring me a basket of vegetables, and I love that. And I still work the same way. I like barter system. I do something for you, you do something for me, but no exchange of money. And I guess because I was raised as a triplet and had no identity, I was very concerned that I would always know people, not as the outside shell, but how they are inside. And so I worked very early on. I worked with, I guess, children who had no identity, who had all the care in the world, but nobody knew who they were. And that's blind and retarded and brain damaged children. And we opened even in those days, and that's ages ago. We had the churches, you know, they use on Sundays, and the rest of the week they're locked. And we asked one of the ministers to give us his church, so we can have a daycare center for brain damage and retarded and blind babies of very poor families who had five, six, seven, eight, nine kids and just didn't have the time nor the, the ability to watch over a very, very uh, damaged child. We would pick them up in the morning and have a daycare center in a church uh, building and with just, uh, I want to say, black mommies. Do, do you know what I mean by that? Just loving, caring, nurturing, big bosom moms would take care of these children. It was all love. And those women who had not had psychology or child, early childhood edu uh, education or any degrees, they did miracles for those children. But they had no money for consultants and anything, so I would work there half a day a week. Uh, as a volunteer contribution. I learned more from those those uh, people than in any university you can teach, you know, very practical kind of things. And they did ter terrific progress and I loved every minute of it. And then I worked with blind children at the Lighthouse for the Blind in Chicago. And then I started to work with, well, first when I came to the States, I worked with the chronic hopeless so-called schizophrenics. And they taught me everything I know now, working with dying patients. They taught me the symbolic language. That's a totally universal language that you can communicate with on, with any human being, with any national language. That's the language dying children use when they tell you that they know they're dying. And the parents don't believe that the five-year-old can know that they're dying. And, and I always got gifts in exchange to my caring for those people. Caring from here, not necessarily only from here. And so I learned, most of what I learned, I learned from my patients. And then I started working with young patients, and you know the rest of the story. First only with grown-ups, then with children, then with parents of suicidal children. That's the third cause of death among our children, from 6 to 16. 
And then we started working with parents of murdered children. And then we started working with the Vietnam veterans who have committed suicide twice as many as all the men who have died in Vietnam. There is always, it's like one crisis to another, to another. It's, it comes in waves. And now the AIDS people is a horrible problem to have AIDS because people are afraid of them and they are shunned and they are isolated and lonely and labeled and terribly discriminated against. Schools refuse to take children of AIDS in a classroom. There are no rules and no laws. Nobody knows what to do with all these people, and it doubles every six months. You had originally been very apprehensive about coming to work in America. Yes. How do you feel that the past 30 years, this It's is where... It's the biggest I'm... blessing. I could have never done this work in Europe. Never. I mean, everything that's horrible in your life, if you wait long enough, turns into a blessing, and I'm not exaggerating. That's why our saying at Chantinilaya is, should you shield the canyons from the windstorms, you would never see the beauty of their carvings. If I had stayed in Switzerland, I would have probably a nice, old-fashioned country practice, <clears throat> deliver babies and suture up faces, and, you know, have a country practice, and I would like it, but I could have never done as much as you can do in a country of this size and all the possibilities. You feel that America has really enabled you to be free in doing, pursuing whatever it was that, that you had? It was a heck of a time, but it's a question of who is more stubborn. And I had a very stubborn father, and I learned from him to stick it out. Yes, without America, I could have never done this work. You know, one thing about America is that here you're able to really get your message across and, and the messenger is also always in the limelight. You know, you have representatives like that's Dr. Caldecott. Life. I hey. don't know if that's a blessing. Yeah. How, how has it affected you being a celebrity? My life was very, very simple and nice and uncomplicated. And I have a feeling I achieved as much, at least on, a, on an individual basis, when I was... Uh, totally unknown commodity. And then in November 2169, when the Life magazine article came out, it was all over the world overnight. And my life changed drastically. The worst part is the mail. We have about 125,000 pieces of mail a year. And to answer that is a constant eternal struggle and headache. But you have to answer it because most of them are pleased for help. Or they recharge your battery and tell you, 10 years ago this and this happened and you saved my life. And, you know, it's both. It's, I need you, but also I thank you for the outcome of whatever you did at that time. So it, it balances out between, it can't suck you dry because you get also a lot of nurturing. So it sustains you in many ways, but it also wears you out. Uh, the problem in the United States is the cost of running a service to mankind that brings in no nickel. To answer 125,000 letters costs you a total fortune. Mail stamps is, is the smallest, the secretaries and the... the The cost of running a, our office is between forty and fifty thousand dollars a month. And if you do a service without charge, it's it takes a genius to, to bring in that money. And we have no soliciting of we have no grants, we have no foundation money, we have nothing. And that means you're doomed to lecture until it comes out of your ears. <laughs> is that how you feel? Is yes, many times. Not yeah. always, but many times when it gets to a point like now I want to uh, build this center for the children and the absolute minimum amount I need in the next few months is $125,000. On top of the $50,000 a month just to run the office, to answer the mail of desperate people and organize workshops and all that. But to be a public commodity... I was 
terribly well prepared for that. The way I was born. You, you know, when I was born as a triplet, everybody took pictures. Mm. Everybody knew we are the famous triplet Kublers, but nobody knew our individual names. So you're terribly used to constantly, wherever you go, there is a, a flash, and I'm still reacting to it. The bad part is I can go, I lecture in New York City and talk to 3,000 people. Then I sign 300 books and I go to Kennedy Airport. And I have to go to the bathroom before catching a plane. And I sit in the toilet and somebody puts a book under the door, Dr. Ross, would you mind? <laughs> you, you know what that's like. I'm not exaggerating, but you cannot even pee in peace. That's the side. You just learn to live with it. It's not pleasant. You have no private life. But don't you think that that the lectures are a necessary part of teaching for others? They would never... Oh, yes. Most of the time, I'm very grateful. I can reach people. I can reach a lot of people. I reach like 15,000 people a week. That's a blessing. It also reaches the people who then end up coming to our workshops where we can go much more in depth, which, which I much more enjoy. It also gives us a necessary fund to survive, <clears throat> to be able to see all our patients free of charge. It just reaches a point sometimes where you feel like a prostitute that you have to go out and give another lecture just to pay your telephone bills. Do, do you understand? It's, it's only when it reaches a point where I feel I'm obliged to do it Otherwise, we can't survive. Then it gets to me. Normally, I enjoy, you know, talking to people. When did you first notice that you had this gift of tongues, so to speak, that you were able to really take people in? You don't notice it. See, the first time I had to give a lecture to medical students, my boss just said, Next week, you begin to take over my lectures. And I, I tell you, I was nervous. You can't believe it. I had a dry mouth all week. My knees were wobbly all week. My heart was beating the second I thought about talking to 80 students. I was very shy. I almost died when I went up on that stage to talk to my students. And the only thing that saved me from having a... Not the nervous breakdown, but to just shiver, was that I thought I will talk for one hour and give a theoretical lecture. And then I give them a practical application of what I talked in theory. And they can verify it and check it out. And so I asked the young girl who was dying of leukemia, a 16-year-old girl, if I could bring her into my classroom, and she would answer the students' questions. And she was so thrilled that somebody finally listened to her and even acknowledged that she was dying, that she was the best teacher in the world. And I used her example in the following lectures, like one day I would talk about pathological obesity. I would give a theoretical lecture for one hour, and then I brought the 370-pound man in, and the students were able to verify whether the theory was applicable to that patient. And so I weaned myself into becoming a teacher. But I always had a patient who would back me up, you understand? And so gradually, after a year or two of teaching this way, I counted on always having a patient who could pitch in and show the practical kind of side. And I loved that kind of teaching. And then when I was asked to give the first lecture, I was nervous, but, you know, when you have talked to 80 students, if you have 800 people, all you have to do is take your glasses off. And you only see 80, 80 people. Mm. And by the time you have done it 100 times, you can even do it with glasses. Mm. That's a very slow process. You're, you're not even aware how more self-confident you get. It's happened so slowly. But did, when you decided to break away from the medical establishment and they to pursue... 
I've never never made a conscious decision I'm breaking away from a medical establishment. I worked at the medical schools uh, from Colorado to Chicago to, to all over the place in medical schools. And only after doing the death and dying seminars for five years, I decided that I have to have more contact with patients and teach more and make this a full-time business. And in those days, nobody would hire you. In those days, nobody knew even the name of a thanatologist. So I decided the best way I can serve the most people and teach in a greater number of places is if I'm not employed. You can't travel to Japan and Europe and all over the world if you're an employee. And that's when I began to be independent. But it was not a rejection you felt by your peers or anything like that because they were so totally unaware of what you were attempting. You see, that too was really a blessing. I didn't experience it as a blessing at that time. But now, looking back, if, I, if my work with dying patients would have been welcomed with open arms, I would have probably done it for a year and then stopped. It was the, the labels I got and people spit in my face. and I mean, they really treated me horrible. I mean, grotesque sometimes. It was the resistance that made me aware of how horrified people were and how frightened. And it was their fear that taught me to continue that and to change that fear into more understanding of the needs of dying patients. If they would have said, oh, that's great, we have somebody who can teach about dying patients, I would have most likely taught it for a year and then stopped. What do you think was their greatest criticism of you? What were you doing that was so terrible in their eyes that they could not relate to it all? They were horrified that a physician would walk into a dying patient's room and then walk in five minutes later and hear us talk about the patients dying. And they had all sorts of fantasies, like I'm going in and say, let's talk about your dying, you know, which is stupid, but that was their fear. I just didn't beat around the bush, and I said, do you feel like talking about it? And they said, it? And I said, yes, anything you want to talk about. You're a very sick man, and there must be a lot of things going through your mind. And it must be difficult. And they looked at me skeptical, and then they said, difficult? That's not even a word for it. How, how would you feel if everybody tells you you're going to get well, and you know that you get weaker day by day? And the pain, and you ring, and you ring, and they don't give you enough pain medication. And they start making rounds outside in the hallway and whisper about you and stuff like this. And in five minutes, they, they shared what it's like to be dying. So there must have been your colleagues observing this. So yes. how, what were they so critical of? How did they, they want to... The best commentary I can tell you is after Life magazine article came out, some colleagues walked by a minister who worked with me and said, we worked so hard to become known for our excellent cancer care. And then this woman comes along and makes us famous for our dying patients. You know, with, with disgust with how can a physician do something so horrible to us? That was the general attitude. Why don't you talk about the success of cancer treatment, how dare you mention or even bring into the light the fact that in our great hospital people are dying and, and do nothing else but talk about dying. That was how they viewed it. It's like a public insult to an institution who wanted to be famous for their success rate in cancer care. Do, do you understand? I understand that. But the, the negativity and the fear was so excessive that it, it was pathetic. Do you think that that's more true in any kind of great technological society, that there is greater fear of talking about death 
and dying because yes, it's so more, unnatural? The more successful we are, I hate to say that, but I have to say it anyway, the more materialistic, the more technologically advanced and mechanistic uh, uh, societies, the less spiritual they are. And it's in direct proportion, what do you call that? The more they are interested in that, the less they have an understanding of the other aspect of human life. And to bring the two together was my biggest success at the first university because I brought a real super-duper whopper minister uh, into my classroom. And we always interviewed total strangers. We've seen like two minutes to ask them if they would come to our classes. And the minister and I would interview them together. And he was a man and I was a woman. And he was black and I was white. And, and he was from theology and I was from medicine. And it was like a ping pong game where the ball never falls. And it was really incredible. And the patients for the first time was able to share who they were as human beings. Not how big is your lever and did your blood count go up or down. But just the whole human being shared. It was an incredible experience for medical students to see that. And now our whole work is to help people to become whole again, to consider the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual quadrant. And you are whole and you are healthy when those four quadrants are in harmony together. And that was a very, uh, you understand, none of this was planned, this just happened. When you listen to your gut reaction, things just happen and unfold. And that was a very clumsy but very practical attempt to bring the two sides together. And that too was frowned upon, you know. But now everybody's copying it. I was spit in the face, I was called a vulture, and 10 years later the same institutions gave me 18 or 19 or 20, I don't know how many honorary doctor degrees. All you have to do literally is to stick it out. And after about a decade or two decades, you see that the hardest time in your life were your biggest blessings. Do you understand? If they wouldn't have been so nasty with me, I would have probably been bored and I would have found another area that needs to... But at the, at the same time that the alternative health movement is growing, so are our hospitals and hospital chains. What do you see as a way of changing the hospital structure within? You cannot change an institution or a hospital structure or a school system or, or a prison system or anything if you don't start with an individual human being. The only way you can bring change about is by individual human being becoming honest again as a child and look at their own Hitler and get rid of their Hitler, then I can become Mother Teresa. And I absolutely and totally believe in a, the book by Ken Keyes, do you know that, The Hundredth Monkey? Oh, no, you have to read it, it's an absolute must. It's a tiny, you don't know The Hundredth Monkey? Ken Keyes, you have to read it. It's a tiny little booklet, it was a psychological study and I'm not, if you write that, I'm not quoting it right. I'm just quoting it the way I understood it. <coughs> it's a long time since I read it. They found out in a Pacific island that they studied a certain brand of monkeys. And they watched the monkey suddenly picking a sweet potato and go to the ocean and wash the sweet potato before he ate it. And the next day, two monkeys copied the first one and the next day another monkey started to wash the potatoes and then a whole crowd of, of monkeys started to wash the sweet potatoes when the hundredth monkey washed his sweet potato before eating it on at the same moment all the same kind of monkeys on faraway islands started to wash their sweet potatoes it's a, beha a monkey behavior study. And I absolutely believe in that, that this is applicable to human beings. 
if you raise enough people to violence and war, there will be such a critical point where everybody will be acting out their violence and war. If you practice and teach people to raise their kids with unconditional love and understanding instead of guilt and fear and punishment, if there is a critical number of human beings who adapt that positive behavior, there will be one critical point where all of mankind will start that behavior. Look at the hospice movement. We struggled for years to start the first hospice. We really knocked ourselves out. We had architects to design the place and the gardens and pick the right people. And now we have a state in, in this country where a hundred hospices came up in one year. They came up like chicken delights. And it's a disgrace. It's not the blessing. Since politics and money came into the hospice movement, I personally would close more than half of all our hospices. The best hospices where we worked very diligently to make a place of practice, unconditional love, and take care of all the needs of the dying patients, not just physical, but spiritual and emotional. They refuse now to take AIDS patients because they're afraid of AIDS patients. And they call themselves hospices. Do you, do you understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So if you want to, under, to change a society or an institution, I believe that you can only change the world and bring peace to the world by starting peace within yourself. And if you have peace, then you pass it on to your children and to your mates and to your neighbors, and it will have an incredible ripple effect. And that's how you change the world. Mm. Nice. That's how the death and dying movement changed, I'm sure, millions of people's lives. It started with one person. And it takes nothing as long as you don't become negative and it doesn't become an ego trip. If you do it with unconditional love, it has to be successful. It's a universal law. It cannot fail. Do you think that the ground is fertile here in America to get this ripple movement going. It's going yes. like you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, but at the same time that's going, then we're plagued with all of these other problems of, you know, oh, we'll President here. Reagan in the White we'll House. And There's many more problems before the end of the century. But if you could see this world at the beginning of the, what is that, the 21st century, you would beam from one year to the other. You would probably dance through the streets. It takes sometimes, when things go too slow, sometimes it takes big catastrophic event on a broader scale to open people's eyes. And AIDS is one of these catalysts that will literally separate people if they are human beings who care for their fellow man, irrelevant of what color or creed or sexuality or, or whatever they are and will take care of their fellow men, or if they bury themselves in fear and condemn and become more negative and more frightened, and therefore also more sick. And that's, that is what's happening now. Mm. And I'm very excited to live at this time, at the end of this century. I, I can... See, I, I'm not denying that it's a horrible world with all the wars going. I just came from Ireland from workshops with grown-ups and with children, and it's tragic what these people go through. And when you think of Beirut and, and the starving children in Africa and everything. But look how one, what do they call it, the punk? The ones with the pink crazy hair? Wasn't he a punk, the guy who started this music for the world? He was a punk band. Yeah, yeah. see... You know how people talk about punks? They're good for nothing. It takes one punk to raise the consciousness of the Western world to finally do something for hungry children. Well, you can either condemn the punk or you can look at the with positive effect one good person can bring and how many children he can save. It's all a question whether what, we, what you get in life, you see 
at the negative or you look at the positive. But what kinds of concrete things are you thinking? Like one of the things that you had suggested on your tape was the idea of um, nursing homes and daycare centers together. When your spiritual quadrant opens up, you have a thousand ideas what you could do with your life. You do what turns you on, what makes you happy, and you'll be successful. What bothers me in our society that has no time and no love and no hugs for old people, we spend six billion dollars to erase wrinkles. I would take those six billion dollars and turn every nursing home into an ET center. I love ET, so I call it ET center. And that's elderly and toddlers together. Old people love to be needed and wanted and touched and hugged and kissed and smooched. And who is better than a toddler to sit on the lap of an old grandma and ask her about the stories of all her wrinkles? They even like pimples. They play piano on them. And in exchange of all this hugging and touching and loving and making them feel wanted and loved, those children who grow up learning what unconditional love is all about. That's a barter. You call a barter, right? That's a barter system that doesn't cost anybody a nickel. It saves a lot of old people from miserable existence just sitting in a chair and eventually tied up and sitting in their own urine and, and, and just existing until they become senile because there's nothing else left. Hmm. Or is the hospice movement a, a way of reintegrating life with productivity and a sense of totality rather than... A good hospice would be. But there are many places who open up hospices now, or wings of hospitals and call them hospices just because of the reimbursement and politics. And they, they, they are not hospices. But be between this old people and the children, I mean, that, that seems so rational and, and inevitable, but you, you still you notice the trend toward more and more childless communities and, and old people sealing themselves off and, and they're often very expensive. Yes, for the rich old people who don't want to be bothered. Mm. But that's a consequence of their own egotism and their own lifestyle. See, there are lots of lonely, lonely old people who do anything in the world to have a feeling of belonging to a group of people who really love them and care for them. And there are plenty of old people who would love to, to live in an ET center. Is, is this going anywhere, do you know? Oh yeah, we started, we started plant seeds all over the world. I just came from seeing a beautiful place from one of my students who has a Clover Center in uh, Portland. Nearest airport where is Portland? Mm. Yeah, outside of Portland, somewhere in Maine. And it's beautiful. He has a nursing home and he has a hospice and in the middle he has a daycare center for children. Mm. And the dying patients in the hospice can look out of the window into the playground and see the children. And it's lovely. Today the there are many good things happening in this world, and no newspaper media ever writes much about it. Mm. Today, the, one of the greatest problems facing the elderly is this whole question of reti retirement, mm. mandatory retirement. And so often, they do not want to retire. Many times they do. But do you see... In a place like this, they would be kept busy. So is your idea of... a this being funded by the government instead of the money, billions of dollars being spent on the erection of more and more hospitals, that they should be erecting these sorts of community places? I have very unorthodox views about money. If I could create an ideal society, there would be no money existing. Everything would be a barter system. My center, if I get those age children, they will not be charged and will be free of charge. And I know that they will survive because there are many, many people who have children, regular healthy children, and they grow out of their clothes and they throw those clothes away or they give it to Salvation Army and it lies somewhere in boxes. I'm knitting already 
for those children, I don't even have them. There are lots of old people. If I would give them the wool, they would be happy to knit little jackets and little things for children. It would keep them busy and they would see the children wearing their hand knit sweaters. They would love it. It costs very little. I have my own sheep. I have my own wool. We can dye our own wool. It takes a group of people who do not view money as God. You need some money. I need money to pay my mortgage so I give lectures. But you need much less money than people expect. No, that's true. But in order to get your center, you are doing these lectures. and Yes, you have to work. I mean, if you work and you do what you do with love, you will be provided for somehow. My ideal place is if I would get those children now, and some of them we are going to get well, I know that too. And they need a place to grow up. Then, when people are no longer afraid of AIDS, because it would be so familiar like measles, right? Then I would open up an upper floor or a downstairs or whatever one part of my place to only lonely old people. And then the ET center gets going. And I would not charge the old people for their living there. Because I have the house anyway and the land and the food. But can you see that as being a, a widespread answer to Eventually, the problem? Eventually, yes. Eventually, every country will be bankrupt, and then they have to find for healthier solutions. That's my fantasy. That's in the next century, when I'm 88 or 90 years old. <laughs> I'm absolutely sure that service to our fellow man should be free of charge. Hmm. If you're rich and die with $10 million in your bank, you know, you may donate the money to add another building. But you should not expect that. You should only expect to get what you need, and you always get what you need. You don't always get what you want, but there is a universal law that you're always provided for. As long as you ask, you're humble enough to ask, that you get what you need. It's good to know. We're being evicted by next week and we've got three kids and we don't know where I they're going. I tell you that it works. <laughs> I've, I've practical experience on that. Mm. We started a workshop one day. It was January, I remember, about five years ago or so. And I had a workshop in California with about 60, 70 people. They came from all over the world, from Australia, from everywhere. And that was in California. And at 7 in the morning, my bookkeeper called up, all upset, and said, Elizabeth, you have to cancel the workshop. I said, cancel my workshop, you must be out of your mind. It's Monday morning. Workshop starts at lunch Monday. She said, you have to pay $10,000 for room and board at the convent. <coughs> you have to pay before we start. Anyway, she called up and said, I have to cancel, we don't have the $10,000, we have to pay for a week, room and board, and we have to pay ahead of time. And she said, and besides, it's payday today, and we don't have the payroll. And I said, the payroll, they just have to wait a day or two. The workshop, we cannot cancel, because people travel all the way from Australia to California, you can't tell them, sorry, it's cancelled a few hours before. And it was 7 in the morning, and I'm not awake in the morning early. So I said, you know, I go around the world and always tell people, you always get what you need. We need the payroll, and we need the money for the workshop. If this is actually true, then a miracle will have to happen. But we cannot cancel. Now, don't bother me anymore. I'm still asleep, and I hang up. And she called me again like an hour later, and really, you know, like a bookkeeper. I mean, I can't blame her. And I told her again, you always get what you need and something will happen. I'm not awake yet, I'm still out of my body, so don't bother me anymore until I wake up on my own and then I call you back. And about five to nine, it rings for the third time. And she's hysterical at the other end. And she said, Elizabeth, a miracle happened. <laughs> Very difficult not to say I told you so. <clears throat> because you say that, but you don't believe that it happens to you and it happens with such a big amount of money. And she said, <clears throat> an anonymous letter was delivered, special delivery, 
at quarter to nine. No mail is delivered before nine o'clock. A special delivery letter was delivered at quarter to nine in the morning with an anonymous check from the stingiest country in the world, Switzerland, with the exact amount of money we needed that month. And it came at quarter to nine in the morning of our workshop. <laughs> I tell you, that made a believer out of me. <laughs> and things like this happened to me in my life all the time. So you have no problem whatsoever with Duchardin's idea of planetary consciousness and that something is really going to happen. Oh, no, and I feel very positive about it. Do you mind talking about your guides and how... Well, I don't know. That's always such a difficult thing. I mean, Everybody I'm has a guide. But when you work with dying children... You ask them about their playmates, or they tell you very spontaneously about their playmates. They all, little children always communicate with their playmates. And then by the time they go kindergarten or first grade, they shouldn't dare to talk about it because they're a big boy now, you go to school. And then you totally forget that you ever had a playmate. And then if they're dying, or sometimes when they're 90 years old, they have a near-death experience, say, my God, you know whom I saw. That was my playmate when I was three years old in the sandbox. And the instant recognition and love and understanding and knowing each other and familiarity. Well, what do you think is the greatest obstacle in people remembering or yeah, seeing? Negativity. Have you ever seen grown-ups in the Western world encouraging children to talk about their playmates? It's just now beginning to happen. I had a little Corey in, in Seattle who died about six weeks ago. He was an old, wise soul. I mean, you looked at this child, you had the feeling you talked to a 90-year-old man. And he was ill for many years. About half of his life he had leukemia. He talked about his guides and his help was like he would talk about this zucchini bread. And his mother was totally open to it. And shortly before he died, he had a near-death experience. And he was so excited. He said, Elizabeth, I have to draw you a picture of what it's like on the other side. And he drew this gorgeous rainbow with a summer castle at the end of the rainbow. And the smiling star that said to him, Welcome back home, Corey. And he said, Elizabeth, you talk to a lot of grown-ups. Would you tell them that this is not just a rainbow? This is the side view of the bridge that leads from this life into the next life. And I have the picture here for the workshop. And then he got like cold feet a few days afterwards. First he was totally excited about it. And then he called up and he said, Elizabeth, I have one more question I need to know. Is Quasar going to wait for me? I didn't know what Quasar means. He said, silly, that's the name of my dog who died two weeks ago. <laughs> so I told him, I can't promise, but I know if you really need him badly, you should ask now. But you can still think clearly, and once you express your need, they know it there. So if you get there and you need him, you know, they, they will know your needs and he will be there. If you only want him, he may not be there. But if you really need him, you ask now and he, he will be there. He had another near-death experience. And he called up very excited and said, Elizabeth, not only was he there, but he wiggled his tail. <laughs> I mean, adorable. And I said, well, are you ready now? No longer afraid? And he said... I think my mom is not quite ready. I think I have to hang in there another couple of weeks. When he died, the mother and the little sister is an absolute doll. They are totally in touch with the reality of life after death because of this little stink. But that's one of the few family members that never discourage the children from talking about loud about their playmates. But does it have to be life after death? 
Can't it be life within life? Can't we recognize? You were talking on when the When people get rid of their negativity, that's what life will be like after the end of the century. Do you know how many people are now growing spiritually in quantum leaps that before may have taken a hundred years, takes now about two or five years? Things happen at a much more accelerated rate. Our children's children will wonder why it was such a big deal to even mention the word guide and you're called a, you know, a cook or, or, or some other labels. Our children's children will know about that like, like we breakfast. We are in a very rapidly evolving, how should I say, improvement. Do you understand how I mean that? And, and you know, like, the darkness is always the darkest just before dawn. If, if you would view the evolution of, of mankind in this world, we are now at the brink of dawn. That's why it's so dark. Well, when did I first talk about life after death in public? About 10 years ago. Or 12 or 15, I can't remember. But I talked about that. What I at that time thought was coincidence was naturally divine manipulation. A mother dashed to the stage at the end of a lecture and said, Dr. Ross, all I need to know, and she, she sounded very desperate, is what is it like for a child to die? What is this like? And I said, oh, very simple. If you give me 10 minutes, I will share with you, you know, what, what I found out. And I totally forgot that I never talked about that in public. And it was in a sass in the Bible Belt. And I talked about it. And this mother dashed up on the stage and took the mic. We had the most private dialogue. We were totally oblivious that thousands of people listened to us. And she gave me my first example of a two-year-old who had a near-death experience who told her, Everything we know now about near-death experiences. And the next day, it was all over the newspaper. Chicago Tribune, psychiatrist discovers life after death. Discovers. My husband didn't talk to me for three days. Now, you can go anywhere in the country and talk about it, and you're not shot. There were two, three people walk out because it doesn't fit their idea of but things change so fast and rapidly. All you have to do is to drop a little, and 10 years from now, everybody talks about it. You also talk about the power of intuition. How does intuition and the guides relate? What is, what is the relationship there? When you have no negativity, when you take care of your physical quadrant, your emotional quadrant, you get rid of your negativity. And you keep up to date with your intellectual quadrant. You're in harmony between the quadrants. Your spiritual, intuitive quadrant opens up. And then you get totally in tuned to where you need to be, what needs to be done. Your choices, your decisions are based not just on your head decisions or where can I make more profits and all that stuff, but you just know inside that's where you need to be, even if they chop your head off. Your head gets never chopped off, you know. They put you through the grinder and the tumbler, and you come out polished instead of crashed. That's all. But when, you are, when your intuitive spiritual quadrant is open, then you will also be tuned in to all the help you get in this life from the other side. So are you saying that we are still receiving that help, although we are not conscious of it? Every human being gets that help from day one until they die. They practice nothing but unconditional love. They are in this room, and they, they are with you and with you and with me. Day and night, and the advantage they have, they don't have to sleep, they never get tired. They're always with you. And when your own spiritual intuitive quadrant opens up, you become aware of those presences. And sometimes you're lucky and you can even see them. 
And sometimes you can talk to them. And some lucky people even have them materialize. But you don't need that. In fact, the less of that you have and the more you're aware of their presence, the more it enhances your faith. You, you talk a lot too about the transfiguration of, of, of people who have gone through the death experience, like the blind being able to see again or the, the deaf being able to hear. Is there any particular reason why, if we harbor those capacities, why we can't manifest them while we're still walking about? That will come in the future. I don't think man has earned that yet. Does he have to earn as a civilization or individual by individual? It's all, civilization always starts with individuals. See, it's like... If you would look at humanity, some people are in kindergarten, some in third grade, and some in high school, and some at university. And the more you evolve and develop, the more gifts you get, but also the harder are the tests that you have to go through. The tests get not easier, but harder. But you can also take them better. Do, do you understand how I mean that? You can heal. You can heal. I can heal. Everybody can heal. But you can't heal because of your own doubts. Mm -hmm. Once you get rid of that, you can heal. So these workshops and, and most of your work is a way just of sloughing off the... To open up their spiritual quadrant and get rid of their unfinished business. But... 82 to 92 percent of all workshop participants have a positive permanent life change, statistically measured. And the ones who don't are too afraid and block off and close up, or they are not quite ready yet and they come a year or two years later and then they're ready. Doesn't mean they are. You know, the ones who make it are better than the ones who don't make it. It's just a question of of time. Like you wouldn't teach a first grade or high school math. Everybody will make it eventually. Is there also awareness of, of the time to die that comes with that? Oh, yes. Everybody knows when they die. Even, even young kids who have a traffic accident know before that happens that they die. Everybody knows. Five, six-year-olds who die now. But isn't the technology interfering with what the perception would be would be of your natural lifespan and all of a sudden the doctors come in and say we are going to sustain you behind all... You know. No, see, they know that they're dying, but they don't know it here. They don't know it intellectually. That's your intuitive spiritual quadrant that knows. And the more tuned in you are to your own inner knowledge, the more you begin to be consciously aware of it. But I've had kids who died within a second from accidents and things like this. When you look at their drawing before the accident, you can see in the drawing that they knew not only that they're going to die, but how they're going to die. It's, it but to get in touch with your, uh, to, to me the spiritual quadrant is that spark of God that is planted in all human beings at birth, that has all knowledge. You have all knowledge, and you and I, but to get in touch with that knowledge, we only get in touch you know, bits by bits by bits by bits, and the more you open up your spiritual quadrant, the more tuned in you are, and the more you know, quote, unquote. It's not an intellectual knowledge, it's a spiritual intuitive knowledge. And if you trust that inner knowledge, then you grow in quantum leaps, and then your life is never the same. And then you fall back again and you fall into a crevice and you have to climb out again. And the more crevices you fall in, the stronger your muscles. <laughs> it just seems like in some cultures that there are people who have manifested that kind of thing with some regularity. I mean, consciously. Like, in, in, I spent some years in India. 
And there were there are always some people who are quantum leap year ahead of us. Yeah, but being able to, to say, like, next Saturday at noon, I'm having a few friends over to my house, and I will be... You don't have to go to time. India. You stay in a wrong country. Look at some old Eskimo women. They still do that, and they still know that. They invite their tribe in, and they cook a big meal. And then after dinner, when they have fed them well and loved them and said all the nice things that you want to say, they step out and they die. You don't have to go so far. See, there are such old wise people in every culture. But this culture, despite all its economic and educational, its height seems to manifest that less often than places like the Eskimos or India. Naturally, you know, why people incarnate in these societies to learn lessons about making money or something else and not spiritual growth. Everybody picks their own environment where they learn that aspect of life that they limp behind. It seems that in this culture in particular, we are pretty familiar with the idea of death. I don't know much what happened before 1969, but certainly in my upbringing, you know, my mother died right in my, my home. And kids today, you know, they watch it on television constantly. They, you know, Mr. T's shooting this guy this week and... Violent death. You know, it's just, yeah, all mm -hmm. kinds of death. They watch... The media is full of death. Of violence. Yes, of violence. And... It's a different. But the thing is, is that we are very familiar with the idea of the possibility of our demise. There's not... Every child knows, you know, that he can die. But the idea of getting old is something that is so separate from our reality. That's something that's in the future, something so far out there. It's almost the same as eternity somehow. You just, you, there's no way to relate to that. So today in this society, how can we bring this idea of aging with respect giving purposefulness to the aged, you know, letting them have a rightful place in society, let them share again. Now we're just putting them out to pasture, basically. This is a very production-oriented country. As long as you're productive, it means you bring in money, you're a wanted employee. When you get slower and older and think a little slower, you're put out or early retirement or whatever you have. So old age is associated with loss of dignity, loss of respect, loss of good looks, loss of youth, loss of, uh, you know how they all jog and exercise and, you know, those, those groups that come up all over and make a fortune with body uh, exercising machines so you should look young and healthy and superman and superwoman. When you're old and you get a little flappy and you have hanging bosom and you have a big fat tush and you don't look the American image of, of youth, then you are. We have to change our whole attitude about what is beautiful and what is acceptable and what is valuable. But if you raise a generation of children that learn unconditional love, not I love you if you look beautiful and I love you if you bring in money and I love you if you make good grades and like God, but I love you if I can say my son a doctor. If you raise a whole generation in a healthy, natural way, not normal, what is very unhealthy, then people would not be afraid of old age. Then they would see old age as wisdom and life experiences and a grandma who and love the grandchildren unconditionally and a lot of positive things. It's just, you know, I, in doing this research, and David and I, it's, you didn't see the letter, but we sat down, and this has been pretty much the case ever since we've been together. I picked you out of about 25 interviews totally blind. <laughs> and it did not come from here, I can swear you, because I never read what you wrote. We were preparing we said, to come all the way to Escondido to interview you. We read in the paper the next week that you were going to show up here. We live 10 miles from here. So you think that's coincidence? 
That's the van manipulation. This is what's happened to us. Yeah. Constantly. Well, so don't worry about the eviction. <laughs> no, we're not. We're here enjoying yeah. ourselves, having, you know. But it was, it was just amazing, you know, that you're here, I'm here. It's all wonderful. But the, the thing that's, I'm really starting to become aware of, a whole new category of human being. I've I've just been reading constantly the last few weeks, and and I think that we've got you know I would like to know how to begin, how to organize, how to disseminate some of these ideas so that it's not going the to ultimately be... The interesting thing is that you don't have to do anything, you don't have to plan anything, you don't even have to know what you're doing next year. I have never done any of those things. If anybody would have told me 20 years ago that I talk about life after death, I said would have dropped dead. I mean, totally dropped dead. If you do today what feels right, and you're not afraid what people think about you or say about you, and you just do today, it can be a small thing. Help a neighbor clean the kitchen. Whatever it is. And if you're open to follow your own, I used to call it gut reaction. Now I say it in intuitive spiritual quadrant. If you just do what feels right today, tomorrow will be super and you do the same thing and the same thing and will lead, lead you where you need to be and teach you what you need to learn and to teach. I never made plans I'm going to work with plant retard and then with schizophrenics and then with dying grown-ups and then I go to children and then if anybody would have told me that I would have thought they're you know a little yeah but at the same time you've you've always really fought for your you have to be voice. determined to do what feels right and if you do that you will have lots of obstacles but you will always get enough nurturing to keep you going. My dying patients were so incredible helpers because every time they would, like in the hallway, they would make these nasty remarks and they would give me a hard time. And I would walk into a room of a dying patient and they press my hand without saying a word. They looked at me and all their whole soul said, thank you for being here. And, and I said, you know, why should I worry about this nutty residence or this, this uh, nasty nurse? If I get one look in a year of a patient like this, then I know I'm a physician. Do, do you understand? You, you get very little spoiled. You get just enough to sustain you, but you will always get what you need. I cannot emphasize that enough. Well, this man is... <laughs> That's his life, yeah. and I have to believe because yeah. he's brought me along. And I give. Working. I don't know if I was on that tape, but you remember the story of the woman who pulled my blouse at San Francisco Airport. I lectured for three days, and I was hoarse. I had to talk from nine in the morning till nine o'clock at night, three days in a row with air conditioners blowing, and I'm very allergic. Not allergic, medically speaking, but I can't stand air conditioners blowing. And I get hoarse quickly after I talk for three days nonstop and with the air conditioners. And I was hoarse at the San Francisco airport. I was on the last flight to San Diego, had to unpack my suitcase, do the laundry, repack and leave the next morning for Europe. So after seeing endless number of patients and lectures, I usually, when I'm at the gate and my plane is there, I begin to switch gears and I concentrate you know what I have to pack tomorrow and how I get the laundry done and whatnot. And I already switched gears and the plane was about five minutes before departure. And the woman comes and pulls my blouse and says, Dr. Ross, all I want you to say, no, my name is Mary Smith. And this woman knew that instantly. I didn't say one word, but I obviously was not open. And she said, in October we lost our one and only son, nine years old, of cancer. And two weeks afterwards, our 11-year-old daughter was diagnosed to be full of cancer beyond any treatment. And we are so angry at her, she didn't even allow us to mourn for our one and only son. Every time we walk into a room, we yell at her and we get into a fight. 
And you understand, she felt terribly guilty about that. She knew up here that this is a horrible behavior of her supposedly loving parents, but they just couldn't help it. And there was so much despair and please help us. And now five minutes before the plane boards or leaves. And all I did, and I don't even call that the prayer, I just thought to myself, God, if I had one hour right here, right now, I could take care of both things. I swear in 30 seconds the loudspeaker came and said, very matter of fact voice, uh, flight 83 is delayed by one hour. I almost passed out. We sat on the floor at the gate, all on a similar kind of carpet, and did what we had to do. And I left for Europe, and this mother is now helping more parents of you know, multiple cancer uh, children, they probably lived on a dump of radioactive something because all their children died in six months of different kinds of cancers. But it works, I tell you. And you don't have to fold your hands and go on your knees and make long, complicated formal prayers. All you have to express is your need. And if you really need it, it happens. If you don't get it, you don't need it. You may think you need it. Well, I really needed to meet you. And, <laughs> and there are absolute experts in a love that can say no. You sometimes think that you really desperately need something. And you plead and you beg and you say, please, I really, really need that. And nothing happens. And ten years later, he says, thank God, I didn't get it because if I had gotten it, I wouldn't be where I am today. Like I found three ideal places for a center. I was married for 22 years and I'd asked my husband to come to Idaho and to Virginia and to this and that place. I found the ideal farm for a center. I had no idea what center. I just knew I had to get a piece of land with a farm to build a center, but I had no idea what it was. And many times I dragged him to gorgeous places, you know, which looking back now would have been much less expensive. And he liked it and he loved it. And the minute before I was ready to sign a contract, he vetoed it. And now I know that this would not have been the right time. I just got in touch intuitively with, with what was to be in the future, but the time would not have been right. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, that this article is it's about, for the lack of a word, geriatrism, getting old people back into life and getting them reinvolved not only in their own problems, which are sufficient, but reaching out back into society again. You have to organize programs where old people are allowed to live, and to live means to be allowed and able to give and take. Nursing homes are geared towards giving the old people their basic needs. Room, board, slippers, television set, whatever. And that is not good enough. Every place for old people has to have facilities where old people are able to contribute something to mankind or to society or to the community. And to just bring in some Girl Scouts to sing for them is not serving that purpose. Or to have old people make mosaic ashtrays if they've never smoked in their life. It's very belittling. Do you, do you understand? You ask, what are your gifts? What is your life expertise? What were you good at? And then you look for a recipient. Who needs that? And you will find plenty of people who need what old people can contribute. And if they can do nothing else but hold a little baby in their arm, and rock it, that's a great contribution. And almost any old person can do that. What do you think of, I mean, the, the most open paths? I mean, you, you must have a lot of older people in your workshops and things. But how, do they seem to be actively looking for some way to get Our back? Our oldest person who has worked in our workshop was 104 years old. And they get rid of a lot of old unfinished business. And this woman died two weeks later. I had an old woman who started writing a book. The title was uh, Today I Go Adventuring. She started writing poetry, how you can 
adventure into a life between 80 and 90. She was blind on top of it. If you have a gift of language, you use that. If you have a gift of geography, you get the kids together and they teach them what they learn in traveling to the Antarctic or whatever. They're always recipients, especially if you're not charging. I'm, I'm serious, because an old wood carver, do you know how great it would be for kids who grow up without a dad to have a grandpa who can teach them how to carve wood? There are so many things they can do. But do you see that this, this thing about the society now, the kids have all become interested not in, in I mean, in simpler societies, the kids are interested in what they're going to be doing with their lives, and the old people are a resource because they know the history, they know the tales, they know the trades. Do not emphasize what is not or what kids don't want or don't have. Try to emphasize on what is available and then look for those who are willing to accept it. There may be 1%, and in the next decade there will be 10%, and 25 years, 100%. Okay, but you were, you're relying more on this transformation coming on the spiritual There is a transformation going on every day. I travel the world once a year, minimum. And I see the changes in every country I visit and have not seen for a year. Most dramatically, what kind of change? Every kind of change. If I would have talked in the South, what you call the Bible Belt, about life after death, that all of us are going to return to the source. All of us. Not, not just the saints, but also the sinners, eventually. I would have been lynched. If I would have talked in the church in the South about near-death experiences, they would have said, I'm of Satan. Now I can go into the same kind of church and ask the congregation, how many of you have had such an experience? And ten hands go up and I pick a, a random person and say, could you come up on a pulpit and share that with a group of people? And they will do it. And they will not be laughed at. And they will help others to share their own experience, which ten, five years ago would have been taboo. Things like this happen everywhere, all over the place. Yeah, but this isn't just a natural spirit. I mean, you can almost, you can trace your own particular position in this because it's, it's you more than anybody else that has brought this to public dialogue. It does not matter who started it. The matter that matters is that it's happening. And spreads. And spreads every day, everywhere. And do you leave the manner of spread and dissemination up to the Divine evolution manipulation. of the Okay. <laughs> now, I just wonder if you have any sense of politics in this, that there's things people can do politically or socially that are also going to assist this. If you switch that off, I will tell you something in two minutes. This is where you least expect it. But do you see any way you can consciously be ready for it or maximize the... You can only help the world and this planet Earth that has been almost destroyed by changing yourself. Because if you practice that, it will have a ripple effect that's always stronger than the negative forces that are very predominant now in this country and will become stronger and more vicious. Now? Yes. Out of fear, naturally. Well, this is <clears throat> definitely a fear that David has had, and and I don't know. It's um, he has. But it's necessary. Mm. If you want the diamond out of a piece of rock, what do you do? You put it in a tumbler, and you rock it and smash it around, and what's no good is going to fall apart into sand, and the good part will get more and more. Till it becomes a diamond. I'm exaggerating because that's not how you make diamonds. But I'm, I'm using symbolic language. I always tell people in the workshops, if your life puts you into a tumbler, your choice is whether you come out crashed or polished. It's all a matter of your choice. 
And if you get polished, then you're ready for everything that's going to come. And you will literally rejoice. And you have nothing to fear. The only thing that, that drives you crazy with the urgency of it, though, I mean, in America, it seems like and there, there is a, there's a, obviously an underclass and the poor who have things happen to them rather than actually being able to do things about their lives. But here, I mean, there's so many different kinds of therapies. There's so many different kinds of groups where people are trying to get in touch with themselves or build their minds or their bodies or their spirits. And yet, what, what really, when you travel around the world, as you've had, you know that in Africa or in India, while everybody here is polishing the finer points of their spirit, they're, they're just dying in the streets there. And it, it's hard to see, I mean, looking through their eyes, how it can possibly get any worse from powers that they have no control over. Yeah. Don't add that to whatever you write, okay? Mm. I asked one of my guides who said to me he wants to be born, he wants to live one more physical life. And I said, you must be an idiot to choose to live in this earth with all these headaches and problems when you can be in a gorgeous place. And with incredible love, he said to me, I'm going to choose to be born as a child and die of starvation as a child. I'm very blunt, and <laughs> I said to him, you know, you must really be sick to choose such a life. Now, what possible positive purpose could that have? And he said, with great compassion and understanding, and not at all upset how, how disrespectful I talked to him, he said it would enhance my compassion. Do you know how these starving children in Ethiopia, or wherever they are now, enhance the compassion of the United States. People who never shared a nickel of their wealth are now putting in thousands of dollars for food. And you think that has no purpose? I've always thought that America... Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Experience. You have no idea how, how a starving child, for example, that you see on television with your own eyes, what this does to some cold cookies who all are worried about is the stock exchange. And that serves no purpose. And they come in for three years, this is for them like a blinking of an eyelid, and then they can go back home and see the effects of their short life. You know, we, we look at things much too much with our na narrow time limit and viewpoint, but we don't see the the consequences of all these things happening now, the long distance consequences. Yeah, but if you open out on the sides too, and this is the thing where, I don't know if Kathy asked you before, but this is something that's always really upset me, is the way people in the busyness of their lives usually have maybe 10 or 20 percent that they can set aside for the world or society or politics or whatever it is. And now it, it seems like there's so many quote-unquote, good causes. There's, I mean, there's the African problem, there's the Central American problem. There's, there's a million problems, what's the problem? So, where, how do you devote your 10% of, of social planetary duty? It makes absolutely no difference if you're nice to a cleaning woman, or to a street cleaner, or to your neighbor. Then you have done a good day, day's work does not matter where you give or what, to whom you assign your, your 10% or whatever you call it. It does not matter one bit. All that matters is that you try to learn to love your fellow man as yourself. And how you practice that and where is totally relevant. We had my biggest teacher in my entire life was a black cleaning woman at the University of Chicago. When this woman walked into a room, something happened in that room, and I was dying to figure out what her secret was. And I was a white assistant professor of psychiatry, just you know, off the boat. I wasn't raised with black-white problems. I didn't know much about, you know, that black is not the same as white. When you grew up in Switzerland, you know nothing. You have no war, no unemployment, no poverty, no slums, no race problems, so you're really terribly naive. 
And I was dying to know what this woman did in those rooms because every time I walked in there, something happened in that room. And one day, and I was very shy, I gave myself a big push, and I heard my own voice telling my medical students, for heaven's sake, if you have a question, ask. And I hear me say that to me, if you can understand that. So I went to this woman and I said, what in the world are you doing with these dying patients? And she got almost paranoid. She was very defensive. She said, I'm not doing anything. I only clean the floors. And I said, oh, no, that's not what I meant. I really want to know, you know, what you're doing. She didn't trust me. I understand that now, but in those days I couldn't understand that. And she walked away. We snooped around each other for weeks. That's symbolic, non-verbal language. I tried to figure out who you are, and she tried to figure out who I am. One day... Weeks after, she dragged me, and that took a lot of guts. I also understand that now much better. She took me in the back room behind the nursing station, and she told me the story of her life, you know, in a really horrible neighborhood in Chicago. Cold, flat, sick children, not enough food, no medicines for the sick kids. One day she went to the emergency room, and they, didn't, they turned her down because she hadn't paid the previous bill. And the last thing I remember, she told me how she took her <coughs> three-year-old on foot in the winter all the way to Cook County Hospital, because there they have to take you. And she waited for hours in the waiting room and watched her little boy die of pneumonia in her lap. And then at that point, I wanted to interrupt her and say to her, why do you tell me all this? What has this to do with my dying patients? And I didn't open my mouth. It was like this woman could read my mind. She looked at me with incredible love and she said, you understand, death is not a stranger to me anymore. He's like an old acquaintance. I'm not afraid of him. And sometimes I walk into the room of these dying patients and they look so scared. I can't help but walk over to them. And sometimes I even touch them. And I convey to them that it's not so terrible. You understand that I promoted this woman to my first assistant, much to the dismay of my academic colleagues, because she taught me that teachers in your life come in very disguised forms. They're not always academicians or big shots or big leaders. They come in very peculiar shapes and forms. And if you can learn that what you need at a given time will come into your life, and if you're open to it and can see, like what this woman was able to teach me. That was the beginning of my death and dying work. Then I was able to teach the medical students that you can have all the knowledge up here, everything. If inside you're afraid, you cannot bring peace to a patient. Do, do you understand that? And if you worry where you put your 10%, you waste your energy. Total waste. No, but you make it sound so easy and offhand of just improving your relations with your, you know, the people around you and, and just making your own life neat. If but you've you, taken your life right through the middle of the fire and you've burned away almost everything in a chosen career that focuses on a problem. It's not just, you don't just go out and carry on a normal career and say hello to the postman and, and conduct yourself like a good, quote, Christian? But some people come here to be the cleaning woman, to teach one person what they need to know. And if that person touches 15,000 lives a week, that cleaning woman, after her death, gets credit for every life I have touched after meeting her. But if it's that spontaneous, why, why, why have you made such a work of it? I'm not saying it comes easy. It's a hard as hell life. Mm. And it gets hard, not easier. I said that, I think, at the beginning. But it also gets easier. The tests that are thrown at you, if, if I would have had to go through what I went through the last seven years, I would have hanged myself on the next tree every day. But by the time that comes, you make it again. It's like a mountain climber. You cannot climb the Matterhorn or the 
Mount Everest, the first time you go climbing, you start with a little more hill and then a bigger hill and then a bigger mountain and then a real big ones. And they are harder and more challenging and more difficult, but it's also easier because you have already gone through the first grade and the second grade and the third grade. Do you understand how I mean that? But people should not think and worry. I think if people would live 90% in the now and 10% in the future, it would be much easier. You learn that as you get older, I guess. But it, for old people wanting, wanting to get their fingers back into life again, then they make it known that they want their fingers back into life again and the door will open to them. But the door shuts so often that I think that so many of them have just kind of given up. Yeah, we see that's a consequence of their choice to give up. Our life, our biggest gift as human beings is free choice. Those who die or who, who age... Um, well, can you say that? Those who have an old age that they live are people who have lived well all their life. If you have worked and shared and given, you have so much support and so many memories that sustain you when you can't do things anymore, that they will enrich your life. If you have lived a very uh, self-centered, demanding life and then you are left alone in old age, it is miserable. And the same thing goes for dying. If you have lived well, you are not afraid of dying, nor of aging. And I think old age care should not start in old age, it should start very young in life. You should develop hobbies. You should give and share, then it will come back manifold. Not only when you're well and healthy and young, but also when you're old. To me, the whole separation to gerontology and thanatology and God knows what is very artificial. Did you read that adorable photo book called Gramps? Look at it, find it. It's a photo book, very few words. It's a young... No, it's an old grandfather who walks through the forest with his grandson, very proud. That's the first picture in the book. It's a story of the family, very simple family, I think from Maine even. The last picture is the son who is now tall like this, and the shriveled grandpa who is senile and doesn't dress anymore and pees in a corner and is incontinent and dying, and it's just skin and bones, and the grandson, who is now a slinky, a uh, 25-year-old, carries this little bundle of an old man into bed. And then he dies with the family, but they stick it out with him. It's a wonderful book. And because the grandpa has, has given this child so much, that in the old age, when he could no longer, it's like the cycle of life, the closure, he becomes now the little incontinent child and the grandson takes care of him. That's how it should be.